Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconan, along with Dennis Dick. And we have Sonny Singh on the line. He is a Chief Commercial Officer for BitPay. Sonny, how are you doing this morning? Good. How are you guys doing? Good, good. We're just uh, coming off the unemployment number. Things are okay here in jobs land. Uh, just to get things started, could you give us uh, you know, a little bit of your education and market background? Uh, yeah, so education market, I, um, I've been working in Silicon Valley for the last 10 years, um, helping to do startup companies. Before that, MBA in finance, so I have a little bit of background in the market, but you know, not an active trader like you guys are, your listeners are. Okay, so tell us about BitPay. First of all, um, how long has it been around? And second of all, BitPay, are you, um, are you like uh, starting a form of Bitcoin and Apple Pay? <laughs> That's what one could think. My parents ask me that every day, actually. No, so BitPay is the largest processor of Bitcoin in the world. We've been around since 2011, which in big Bitcoin years is kind of makes us like one of the oldest companies in the Bitcoin industry. So we've raised over $30 million in funding from the likes of uh, Founders Fund, which is Peter Steele's team from uh, the founders of PayPal, uh, Sir Richard Branson, Lee Kai Sheng, who's the wealthiest person in Asia, um, Jerry Yang, the founder of Yahoo, as well as other firms like Index Ventures, one of the largest VC firms in Europe. So we are global. So we have offices throughout North America, Europe, South America, and then launching soon to Asia. But again, we are just a back-end processor, so we just work with the merchants. Think of us more like the first data for Bitcoin. So how exactly does this work? Tell us how this BitPay stuff works. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's so a great question. Again, I get this all the time, especially from people not in the industry in Bitcoin. So again, we are just a back-end processor. So we go out and sign up merchants to accept Bitcoin. So we have about 55,000 merchants live now on our platform throughout the world. So I am in Miami right now, um, meeting with one of our, our customers, Tiger Direct, one of the largest online uh, computer resellers, uh, computer sales. And so when a Merchant, when a consumer goes to their site to check out, they can check out with you know Visa, Mastercard, American Express, PayPal, or Bitcoin. And to click on Bitcoin, that becomes our back end, and we now enable the consumer to check out using Bitcoin, and we'll take possession of Bitcoin and sell out with Tiger Direct in USD or Euros the next morning. So Tiger really doesn't take possession of Bitcoin, so it's really no risk to them to cons- uh, to serve their merchant consumers. Okay. How many ahead, customers Dennis. do you think you're servicing with Bitcoin? Because you have to have the Bitcoins to be able to play with the Bitcoins. And I don't know anybody that has any Bitcoins. So, like, how it, do you get? How do you go about getting Bitcoins? And then exactly, yeah, that that's this is where Bitcoin is still not mainstream. I would say, you know, because again, in America, most people use credit cards and it works pretty well. And I get my United Miles and all that. But yeah. you know, think of Bitcoin as the currency for the internet, and it's global. So all over the world now, people can go to Tiger Direct's website and shop on that that might not have a credit card before, that might have high transaction fees, processing fees, things like that. With Bitcoin, that's all eliminated. The problem is, how do you get Bitcoins? Yeah. And you have, to have a Bitco- you have to have a Bitcoin wallet, there's Bitcoin ATMs, but it's still not as easy as it needs to be, and that's where the market still needs to go to making it more prevalent. The other concern is, like, let's go say I buy some Bitcoins, and this thing was trading up, like, at $1,000 uh, just going back to a couple of a year ago or two. And now I look at it, it's down in the 300 So if I bought a bunch of Bitcoins there, I just took a major, I have some major currency risk holding that Bitcoins in my account. Yeah, no, the, the currency risk is still very volatile. It seems to have settled down around $350 now in the last couple of months, but we're seeing 3%. Ups and downs, decreases, ups and downs, swings every day. <clears throat> but in the last 12 months, if you go back 12 months ago, it was actually $280, I believe, and now okay. it's 350 So it's actually gone up in the last 12 months, believe it or not. But everyone remembers all the news when it was at trading at $1,000 about nine months ago. Yeah, so what, what's your outlook for it? Uh, can it ever get back up to that level? And um, if, another question following that up. Uh, if Bitcoin doesn't survive... Do you process other products? So, so great question. So, you know, BitPay, again, is the back-end processor for, you know, like for merchants. So we don't really get involved in the 
day to day currency trading and all that. So I don't really follow. The, I actually follow the price. Mm-hmm. I don't monitor it daily and all that because again, we make it so no matter what the price is, we absorb that risk for our merchants. So the merchants never take any Bitcoin volatility. And so you know, I can't predict where the price is going to go every day. There's a lot of experts that keep thinking it's going to go up, but yet it's gone down for the last two months. So I don't consider myself to be one of those PhD experts, but the currency right now serves a purpose, though, to enable people to do cross-border goods transactions, no processing fees, there's no chargebacks to the merchants. So there's definitely a lot of great value for the consumers and for the merchants for Bitcoin. It's just this price seems to keep going up and down and, you know, pretty swings, but it has stabilized a little bit, and we should see, you know, I don't know where it's going to go next year. I've heard anything from, you know, $4,000 in 12 months to, you know, see the $300. But I mean, who knows, right? If it's a stock market or trading regular currencies. How, it, it, and the biggest question is, like, it's so difficult to value something like this. Like, my, my question, so, okay, I, I'm, you know, j- just bear with me here because I don't know a lot about the Bitcoin industry. But if it's trading at $300 for a Bitcoin, so when you go and buy something online that's like $20, do you just get a fraction of a Bitcoin? You just basically take a fraction of a Bitcoin from these people? Yeah, exactly. So the Bitcoin can be denominated, broken down to uh, eight, de- eight decimal points. Oh, okay, so, so when you go to decimal we, points. Yeah, okay. so when you go to buy something that costs $20, you just end up paying point zero zero three Bitcoin or whatever it may comes to. And it's convertible to other current, obviously, to other currencies as well. Besides the dollar, if you like, for Dennis, like, you know, using Canadian dollars, it would be convertible. Um, so, do you, do you think Bitcoin? I mean, we're getting some questions here. One, you know, from Brianna. Uh, you know, is this thing going to survive? And if it doesn't, you know, do you do you, do you process anything else, or do you, is this really the only product you're marketing right now? Yeah, so BitPay uh, has a platform that allows us to work with other currencies. Um, but to be honest with you, you know, Bitcoin is so much larger than any other currencies that are out there. Um, you, you know, I, I think for, you know, Bitcoin 2.0 is, you know, we're just starting out in the second inning of the nine inning baseball game, I think, with Bitcoin. Um, but it's clearly the only, I think it has a 98% market cap compared to all other currencies combined. So it, uh, it's definitely the main one. No other merchants are asking to help support other currencies. But again, I think if Bitcoin doesn't survive, some form of Bitcoin using the blockchain technology would come out of that. Do you have any uh, um, Bitcoins? Or do you have any uh, yes, currency? I do. You do? Okay. Uh, uh, I, own, I own quite a bit. And actually at BitPay, we offer our employees a chance to take payroll in Bitcoin. So we uh, we work with a lot of payroll vendors now that are offering other companies their employees taking payroll in Bitcoin. So I take a certain percentage every every paycheck in Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, what about the the rest of your employees? Are they uh, are they uh, into that? Do they, are they uh, electing that, or is it still a little bit slow? In the yeah. House? So we we've, we've got close to a hundred employees now, and every single employee takes a certain part of their paycheck in Bitcoin. Yeah, oh, that's. Um, cool. We have about. We have about 10, 10 people on our team that take 100% in Bitcoin. Really? Which I, which I, actually, try to, I actually try to tell them to diversify, but they're young, single, 24-year-old guys that don't seem to mind it right now. <laughs> they don't seem to mind having the exposure. No, I mean, I know a lot of people are bullish it. And, uh, you know, it's had, I mean, it had the, uh, you know, the clearing problems. Did, uh, did those problems affect you at all? Uh, you know, when, um, I mean, I think someone ended up committing suicide over it. Did that, did that affect your business at all? You, you know, it, 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 everything affects the business a little bit. You know, we, we, we saw BitPay being the largest processor. We kind of lay hold ourselves to a high standard. Um, our chief compliance officer used to run AML at Visa. We have several people on our team that work for the Federal Reserve. Uh, Arthur Levitt, the former chairman of the SEC, just announced he joined our advisory board. So everything we do, we try to follow with the regulations in mind. So we only work with, uh, you know, we don't work with any high-risk merchants. Even if it's illegal in America, we still won't work with them if they're high-risk we consider. So we try to work with the, you know, the Fortune 2000 merchants, global brands, um, and try to avoid all that, those risky things and keep Bitcoin in a good perception. What kind of effect did uh, Apple Pay uh, have on uh, on your business? Is that did it? Did you think that is a long term benefit, or uh, it's going to hurt you guys? No, I think it's actually great. Um, at any time that innovative, new innovative things happen in the payment industry, 
It's good for any other payment vendors that are out there. So a lot of global brands are coming to me now saying our CEO, because of Apple Pay now, is telling us to be more innovative as well and to start looking at new things like Bitcoin and how to adopt this. And they call us up saying, how, how do we work with you guys? How can we do this? In Europe, we just announced today a partnership with uh, SumUp, which is kind of like the square of Europe. So people can pay their credit card by swiping it or scan their QR code using Bitcoin. Okay. What, let's talk about just briefly the barriers to entry here, just because uh, you're kind of uh, talking about that a bit. What are the barriers to entry here? What's stopping from somebody from coming out with some better Bitcoin? And obviously, there's a few competitors that are out there coming out and that becoming the virtual currency, and then this Bitcoin going to zero. What you know? What what's you know the big barriers to entry to stop that from happening? Yeah. So there's on the outside, it seems like anyone can start their own payments company, whether it be Bitcoin or an Apple Pay type competitor, or a Google Wall type thing. And I just got back from a big payments conference in Vegas that had 7,000 attendees, and there were hundreds of startups there. And having done a successful startup before in my past called Jumio, I, I can see how hard it is. The problem is, what these people don't realize when they start new companies, the payments industry, the banking industry, the finance industry, is the most hardest to disrupt. So yes, you can get your product off the ground, but getting banking relationships with Wells Fargo, holding people's credit card data, PCI compliance. There's so many different rules and regulations. You need to raise like, you know, thirty, forty million dollars in funding for any global merchant to even work with you guys in the payment world. So it's very hard that the entrepreneurs don't realize that. Even though there is right for disruption in the banking industry, it's the hardest space to disrupt. Music, video, film, you know, all these other things got disrupted much earlier because this is the hardest one, hardest nut to crack. Uh, let's talk about some of the other companies uh, you've been. You've been an angel investor in a couple other companies, uh, Tube Mobile, Get Around. Uh, you just mentioned Jumio, Senhub, and Estate As Assist. Uh, are those companies still active? Yeah, so uh, Tube Mobile, actually, uh, I was a seed investor about seven years ago, I believe. It was my first angel investment. Uh, I, invest I was bought that deal by a well-known angel investor named Howard Lindzen who owns a son that comes out with stock twits, which a lot of your readers and listeners might know about. We had Howard um, on last so week. We, <laughs> oh, there you go. I, I figured Howard's everywhere in this space. So great guy. So Howard uh, helped interest me to these guys. This is a great company. He used it for uh, his first company, Wall Street. That's how he got involved with T-Mobile. It was video analytics, and so we invested in the company. And it was just two employees at the time, and they went public about six, three months ago, actually. So ticker symbol T-U-B-E. So it's been a great success. Been happy about that. Another company um, I'm involved with, I just recently invested two months ago. It's called Estate Assist. And, um, you know, you want to just go to state, www.estateassist.com. And what that is, is kind of like your online safe deposit box for all your, your wills, your, you know, something that happens in case you die. How do your next of kin settle all your accounts? How do they close down your credit card, you know, information, turn off your Comcast bill, and you have it all stored online, and when something happens to your executor, just hits a button, and everything turns off. So almost kind of like a life lock, but for estate planning and things like that. So really bullish on that company, too, as well. Yeah, you won't run out of customers on that one. <laughs> no, it keeps going on. It's, it's a great thing, because right now when someone passes, how do you turn off their Facebook account even, right? Yahoo email. You can't do it. You need these passwords. So this all stores online. And with a press of a button, everything gets turned off automatically. Okay. All right. We've had Sonny Singh on the line here, and he is the chief commercial officer for BitPay. Uh, not really making any speculation on where BitPay is going as far as price, uh, but uh, definitely sees it um, increasing in use. So, Sonny, thanks for coming on today. Great, very insightful interview, and uh, we hope to have you on again, and good luck with all those companies. Hey, thanks, guys. Anytime. Okay. Thanks, Sonny.